Hello everybody, welcome and good morning or good afternoon if you are joining me from the UK. I am currently live in London and we're about to continue the Guide to Hegel lecture series. You can join me on Instagram, right in front of me right here, and on YouTube. Apologies YouTube for the lampshade which has broken and so is a little bit in frame. Uh, I'm going to try to get that fixed. The lamp sort of broke to the left a little bit. I uh, hope that you're well. This is a weekly introduction to philosophy and theory live stream lecture that I've been hosting for the past two and a half years now. A bit of backstory, I used to work as an academic at the University of Oxford Brookes and before that at the University of Kent. And when the pandemic forced our in-person lectures to shut down, I began hosting open access live stream lectures for anybody who wanted to join. And I never really looked back. Except back then, it was just a small group of students, most of whom I knew personally. And by now, it's grown into this worldwide community of like-minded learners and thinkers. And so today, we're going to be continuing the Introduction to Hegel lecture series, Hegel the German Idealist Philosopher. Now, if you're a complete beginner, fret not, you're invited to stay a while. These lectures are let's say graduate level is how I would categorize them. So they're friendly towards people who are interested in learning about philosophy, but mostly tailored towards slightly more advanced students, which is not to say that you're not welcome. Anybody can drop in. In fact, if you'd like to download all of my lectures and also download my ebook, The Complete Guide to Zizek, you can find all that and more on my Patreon by going to www.patreon.com forward slash Julian Philosophy. And a huge thank you to the patrons who continue to support this project financially, but also who provide the backbone, the community to this whole, whole I don't know, lecture series. I host a Q&A session, a seminar essentially, after every lecture for patrons. And I also have edited transcripts, ebooks, etc. Lots of learning materials that you can enrich your studies with. On that note, this is going to be potentially the last Hegel lecture for a little while. Next week, I'm going to be going to Oxford and then Paris, and I'm looking forward to having a couple of weeks where we sort of talk about something other than Hegel. So there's going to be some more art and literature and theory involved as well. Uh, but all that and more is coming. However, today I wanted to dedicate 45 minutes or so to a well-known Hegelian concept. In fact, a well-known Hegelian quote, which is that the owl of Minerva only spreads its wings at dusk or the Owl of Minerva only takes flight at dusk, depending on, de depending on how you'd like to translate that. It's, it's a section that comes towards the end of Hegel's philosophy of right. In fact, the entire quotation begins with Hegel essentially announcing or characterizing what might be deemed the end of philosophy, when philosophy paints its gray in gray, as Hegel quite poetically puts it. In fact, I would argue against the notion that Hegel is a poor communicator, someone who doesn't write in beautiful prose. I think not only if you read Hegel in German, but certainly if you have the capacity to do so, Hegel is actually a quite wonderfully eloquent writer and thinker, one who is certainly not entirely accessible, at least at first sight, but one who reveals his beauty in multiple rereadings and layers. And so one of the things that I'd like to do today is I'd like to spend about 40, 45 minutes talking about Hegel's conception of history. Uh, certainly, that's been on my mind very much recently in light of world events. A uh, quote that is attributed to Hegel, which is that the only lesson we learn from history is that we never learn anything from history at all. And that's something I'd like to talk about a little bit more, Hegel's conception of history and why he argues that the Owl of Minerva only takes flight at dusk. All that and more in the coming lecture. However, I know that we are joined by people from around the world, so please do briefly drop a comment letting me know where you're joining me from. It really gives me a tremendous sense of joy knowing that we are connecting around the world. And I know that might be a little bit naive of me, like, you know, is it really a connection? But to me it is. To me it is because that we can use philosophy and learning as a way to start our week together feels really important to me. And it, it brings a lot of light to my life. I see students from St. Petersburg, Boston, hello Boston, very excited for the Celtics to be back soon, Washington, hello Washington, Delhi, India on Instagram, India again Instagram, Los Angeles, hello LA, um, Philippines, hello greetings to the Philippines, thank you so much for dropping a comment.
And thank you for connecting through philosophy. I see Italy, Iran, Tehran, greetings to you. Greetings from Israel, hope that you are well. Mexico, um, London, as am I right now in London, England. Okay, let's dive right in. Um, this is going to be potentially, at least for now, the final lecture in the series titled The Cunning of Reason, or Die List der Vernunft, which is a Hegelian concept, which is a key component of his theory of history. Now, I want to begin right out the bat with this quote, which you may have heard, this concept, where Hegel characterizes knowledge and history as being an owl, in fact, the owl of Minerva. And Hegel writes towards the end of the philosophy of right that the owl of Minerva only takes flight at dusk. And there's a couple of different ways that we can look at this, some which I find to be more interesting than others. In fact, some mischaracterizations exist as well. Perhaps the most common mischaracterization of this Hegelian idea that the owl of Minerva only takes flight at dusk is that we can only know, th know things through hindsight. It's like a Hegelian version of hindsight is 2020, that we can never know things in the moment, but once sufficient time has passed, we can reflect neutrally or objectively on it. That once the history books are written, we will see the truth in its full revelation. However, nothing could be less Hegelian. This is really not Hegel's point. While there's certainly a common sense aspect to the idea that we know things better once we reflect upon them, that we know things in hindsight, Hegel is essentially queuing up or teeing up a philosophical problem. Namely, the problem for Hegel is how do we know something in its true nature? How do we understand something? How do we know its essence? And Hegel didn't believe that the point of history was to achieve a neutral or empirically solid vantage point from which you could observe objectively the events that had taken place in the past. Nor did he believe that we could simply take the facts from history and therefore scientifically or empirically confront the past. Instead, in a way that will make sense to you today, certainly if you're a scholar of history, Hegel was keenly aware of the notion that history is to some extent, to use a loaded word, a construct. To be specific, a construct of the mind. That the very idea of history, of course, as being something that has passed, also means the elevation of a certain vantage point or point of view to make something appear retroactively significant. The common sense quote that history is written by the victors is actually already a little bit closer to what Hegel has in mind, which is that history is not a neutral substance. It's not something that can be known in its totality from a neutral vantage point. That instead, the very eye which perceives history, which thereby creates history as a kind of narrative understanding, is therefore itself involved in this process. In other words, that it doesn't stand outside history, but that it is itself a component of a historical constellation, as Adorno would later write. Whenever you hear the word constellation, at least in philosophical terms, it's usually a tacit reference to Adorno, or perhaps sometimes to Lukacs as well, with his idea that nature is a historical category. And so essentially what Hegel is introducing with the image of the owl of Minerva spreading its wings at dusk is that we can never know something in the moment, but strictly speaking, we also can't know it after the fact. What Hegel is suggesting is that the very act of knowing history, of seeking to attempt to understand historical developments, is not a neutral process, but a process which creates the very thing it seems to analyze. And that therefore to properly know history is to achieve self-consciousness of this very fact. Now, if that sounds altogether too postmodern or even post-structural, let me be very clear that Hegel is not making an argument that history is a meta-narrative or a grand narrative that has to be avoided. In fact, you almost have to look at it from the other side. Once again, Hegel is not simply arguing that history is relative and that we therefore have to deconstruct history, etc. Instead, he's saying that the manner in which history functions is that our misunderstanding of history, our misperception of it as being objective or neutral, is precisely how it continues to function. 
It's a little bit like an old quote that I saw about Americans. It's a little bit cynical that Americans keep learning the, long, the wrong lessons from the wrong conflicts and then applying them to the wrong future conflicts. It's like we take one lesson from one war and then we apply it to another situation where it no longer applies. It's like we're constantly catching up. We're creating new problems by means of wanting to solve the things that we couldn't solve before. And that this Ouroboros movement, this snake eating its own tail, is precisely the movement of history, which therefore mirrors the movement of human consciousness and human action in the world, which Hegel relates to will. And that therefore, again, in classic Hegelian fashion, to truly become self-aware or self-conscious is not simply that you understand history in its totality, which would be a sort of facile historicism that I don't think we ought to attribute to Hegel, but instead that the desire to do so and to misrecognize history is therefore precisely the unfolding of history. The useless precaution, in other words, that to seek to understand history as a total, which therefore implies the idea that you would observe it from a neutral objective standpoint, is itself something which further propels history, not as a necessary unfolding of predetermined events, but therefore as a sequence of accidents, of misrecognitions, of contingent sequences that thereby retroactively take on the meaning or the appearance of a necessity. Think about an election, for example. Whenever an election takes place, for example, I'll give you an example here in the UK. We recently had a, a Labour doing very well in what I believe were some of the by-elections. Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm not from here. And after the, these regional elections took place, the Labour Party was very, very conscious of the strategic error which they might make which is at their annual party conference to appear as if they had already won the general election. In fact, so much so that a memo went out saying that Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, was in no instance to be announced as the future prime minister or the prime minister in waiting. After all, the Labour Party had already learned that there can be good statistical outcomes for them that nevertheless fail to result in general electoral success precisely because they act as if they had already won, thereby creating an environment in which the public no longer wants to vote for you since you are already acting as if you were the victor. Here we have a classic Hegelian unfolding or movement of history, which is that the anticipation of a perceived outcome will already change retroactively the manner in which one conducts oneself apropos said outcome. And that yet precisely in the assumption that that outcome is inevitable or guaranteed, one thereby creates the contingent circumstances by which said outcome ceases to be inevitable. And here we have a very Hegelian idea of the unfolding of history that our understanding or knowledge of what we might project the outcome of history to be is therefore already embedded in the misrecognition of said historical pattern. Now, what's key here, and I want to simplify a little bit by going back to the Owl of Minerva. Essentially, Hegel is adopting a classic symbol from antiquity, which is the Owl of Minerva, Minerva being the Roman name for Athena. Namely, the Owl of Minerva, as you probably are familiar with already, is therefore a symbol of wisdom. And yet it's interesting that Hegel suggests that the Owl of Minerva, the Owl of Wisdom, takes flight at dusk because Hegel is not ordinarily a thinker who believes in the idea of wisdom. In fact, as I've said before, Hegel is in many ways an anti-wisdom philosopher. Hegel doesn't believe in the idea of, let's say, aphoristic wisdoms that can be known neutrally. It's a little bit like if you take a quote out of context, as of course I often do in my shorter clips, if you take a quote out of context from a book, you can't necessarily deduct from said quote the entire contents of the book. And yet what Hegel is essentially arguing, therefore, is that the entirety of philosophy, the history of metaphysics, has tried to do exactly this, 
that the history of philosophy going back to Plato has tried to take a little slice of it, a little slice of knowledge, of understanding or consciousness, and has tried to deduct an entire system, a metaphysical system, around which questions as to ontology and teleology can be solved, namely the question of the nature of being and the question as to the nature of purpose. Hegel's argument is therefore to say that even when we try to create a philosophical system, we're only ever working off of one little piece, and we're trying to create an entire narrative around it that would therefore sustain that piece of evidence. Ironically, Hegel, and I think this is often underappreciated, is actually following Kant here, specifically when it comes to Kant's interest in empiricism. Here we can actually trace a link from Kant to Hegel to Marx. Remember, when Marx, being essentially a Hegelian, when Marx talks about his theory of revolution, which is, of course, a theory of history in disguise, he is talking about it as a science. And this idea that Marx has about the theory of revolution being a science is not just something that he says to appear empirical. And I see someone in the comments who says that they were only just able to join because of a broken link, and I'm so sorry that happened to you. We did indeed have a, a, a I, had to, I had to start the lecture twice because we had some technical issues on YouTube. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Anyway, the point is that when Marx talks about a theory of history that is a scientific theory, we have to see this in terms of Hegel's response to Kant. After all, the Kantian revolution, which is you know, a big dramatic word, but Kant's critique of pure reason was to essentially take something which appeared antithetical to metaphysics, namely Humean empiricism, and to imply a Humean empiricist attitude, namely a scientific inquiry, a form of skepticism, if you will, to metaphysics. And if you read Kant, you will actually realize that part of what makes Kant both difficult to read, but also quite accessible once you, once you understand his, his, his way of putting it, is that Kant is essentially saying, well, what if we approached metaphysics from a scientific perspective? What if we had a logical inference as to the categories and preconditions required by reason in order for essence to be known? After all, if the pursuit of wisdom is the central goal of philosophy, then it is not the pursuit of actionable wisdom in the world, like to be wise and learned, but wisdom here is seen as the insight or the understanding into essence or truth. And this is why it's so important, apologies, there's a siren in the background. This is why it's quite important that when Plato talks about truth, like in the allegory of the cave, he's not talking about truth in terms of truth versus falsehood, at least not in an empirical sense, not lies versus facts, which is of course a very contemporary way, contemporary way of looking at it. Instead for Plato, truth is the highest form of knowing, which is knowledge of the self, but not knowledge of the self in a kind of pre-psychotherapeutic sense, but knowledge of the self in relation to the heavens. This is the classic metaphysical problem, which is to say, what is the relationship of man in relationship to the heavens or the gods? If truth and the source of all knowledge lies in the heavens, then what is the purpose of man? Well, the very clever idea that Plato essentially develops, because Plato is a great systematizer, Plato is one of the first to really create a system of metaphysics, is to argue that man's purpose is to know what truth lies in the heavens, which is therefore the truth of himself. Think about it, what Plato essentially accomplishes, therefore, is that Plato takes a, a, an approach to metaphysics, which posits that ontology, the question as to the nature of being, and teleology, the question as to the nature of purpose, are in fact one and the same. This is the famous Platonic version of the dialectic. In fact, the Hegelian dialectic is a radicalization of Plato, not so much a refutation of Plato. Now, for Plato, the dialectic is, of course, not fully formed. It's essentially almost an allegorical concept about how two points of views and view and dialogue can bounce back and forth until they reach a higher sublated form, 
truth, etc. But within Plato, and where Plato is not platonic enough, if you will, lies already the seed or the kernel of the Hegelian insight, which is that if the purpose of man is to know the truth of the heavens, then what if the truth of the heavens is precisely the exact same such as the truth of man? This is the unity of opposites, which later becomes so important for Marx and Engels as well. And so to go back to my original point, Kant applies a Humean skepticist empirical approach to metaphysics to essentially draw out the consequences of Plato's system of metaphysics. And to make a massive leap backwards, to return into the past, what Plato was responding to in his time was the predominant attitude towards knowledge and the production of knowledge, which was sophism. And sophism, although often characterized, and to my mind slightly mischaracterized as simply being about the peddling of one's rhetorical wares, in other words, a form of self-help from antiquity, whereby you teach people how to make arguments and debates to facilitate uh, 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 upward social movement. Instead, Sophism, and what Sophism was, was an anti-systemic philosophy. It was a philosophy that essentially argued for an import, for, a, a, let me, put, I want to put this very clearly. Sophism was a philosophy that argued for a centrality of the subject. That one of the classic sophisms of the time was that if you spoke the word carriage, a carriage would literally appear on your tongue. Now, Plato was pretty appalled by this. And what's interesting is that, I mean, of course, when we write about Plato, we have to talk about the Socratic dialogue and how Plato essentially took Socrates' ideas and turned them into a system. But let's leave that for another day. Plato was essentially, being a pupil of Socrates, was outraged or scandalized, not so much by the fact that the sophist would sell their knowledge or teach people how to speak, etc. This, is, this was fine, but easily rejected. And said the much more scandalous assumption or idea was precisely this insistence on subjectivity over that of the truth in the heavens. And so what Plato accomplishes through the Socratic dialogue is to essentially take what appears to be the sophistical attitude, which is dialogue and exchange of subjective points of view and opinions, a stylistic feature of Plato as well, but he uses it to lay out the coordinates, or again, the constellation, by which a system of metaphysics comes into being. And this is really vital because so many philosophers who trace their arguments back to Plato are essentially building upon the system, a system of a metaphysical binary, essence versus illusion, substance versus subject, truth versus falsehood. And yet, Plato has a bias. Plato's bias is that illusion and falsehood always lies on the side of subjectivity. That therefore, the subject has to climb upwards or outwards to achieve or reach truth, the heavens. Hence, why self-consciousness for Hegel building upon Plato is therefore to know one's purpose, which is therefore the realization of the heavenly purpose, as it were. Now, you can hopefully start seeing the connection between Plato, Kant, which of course is a massive leap. We could include Christianity here as well. Plato, Kant, and Kant's Christianity, Hegel, and Marx. Plato uses sophism to create a system, a logic, essentially, of metaphysics. Kant uses human, human empiricism, or at least the human empirical mindset, this is his declaration in the beginning of the Critique of Pure Reason, to inquire further into what Plato could not see. Hegel then does that for Kant, which is to say that Hegel is more Kantian than Kant. And in some ways, Marx is more Hegelian than Hegel. Each and every time, the mode of thought, which is the predominant mode of thought of that era, is used against itself. And here again, we have the owl of Minerva only taking flight at dusk. Sophism, being the predominant way of producing knowledge, was used against itself by Plato to create a philosophical system. Humean empiricism was used against itself by Kant to create his own logic, or at least his critique into said logic. 
Hegel used the predominant mode of his time, which was romanticism and idealism, against itself in order to systematize a logic. And Marx used political economy, an anti-historical, sorry, anti-philosophical discipline par excellence, to create a philosophical system. Or to be precise, it was really Engels who then turned Marxism into a philosophy, the philosophy of Marxism, otherwise known as dialectical materialism. Hence, we can actually trace the dialectic through all of these. The Platonic dialectic is the idea of a system of exchange between subjects, which achieves its substance. Then we have the Kantian dialectic, which is the dialectic referred to by Kant as the antinomy. Then we have the Hegelian dialectic, which is the dialectic of substance as subject, by which subject and substance are no longer opposites, as they are in Plato, but they are two sides of the same coin. And then we have the Marxist, more Hegelian than Hegel, Hegel assumption, that the dialectic is in fact the dialectic of history, the dialectic of human revolutionary potential. And so in each of these stages, the dialectic is a key part of their conception of history, and yet in a strange, quite hard to understand sense, each subsequent innovation is not building upon the other, but is thinking what could only be thought in the constellation of said moment. In other words, Hegel could not be a Marxist. Only Marx could be, if you will, a Marxist. Kant could not be a Hegelian. Only a Hegelian could be a Kantian who is more Kantian than Kant. Or, if you will, Plato could not be a Kantian, or a Christian even for that matter, if we not to skip a crucial step with early Christianity. And so the point here is that the owl of Minerva is always taking flight at dusk. It is always arriving too late, and yet it could only ever arrive in its lateness that Hegel could not develop more than what he could develop in his present moment, nor could Marx develop more than what he could develop. That therefore, the trajectory of history, if it, is ha if it has a historicist aspect, is precisely this doubling back so as to reveal within thinkers that which they themselves could not yet think. And Hegel is actually quite outspoken on this front. Hegel essentially posits that the task of the philosopher is to try to articulate or to think that which can only be thought in the present moment. And of course, there is no such thing as a neutral passive. Oh, I think we've lost the connection. I'm so sorry, we're back. I think we're back, apologies. I think we had a bit of a network issue, but I think, sorry. Hegel's argument, therefore, is that to be a philosopher is precisely to ride the wave, if you will, of this misperception of history. And this is the owl of Minerva taking flight at dusk. And what's really interesting here to my mind is therefore that we can reject the notion of philosophy as being about wisdom. That you look back all the way to antiquity and you take those parts of philosophy that you think are most applicable to the present moment, the things that make sense over time, etc. Instead, that philosophy is much closer to what Günter Grass, the German author, once referred to as a Krebsgang. A Krebsgang is how crabs walk. That in the same way that the owl of Minerva takes flight at dusk, to use, it, to use another zoological metaphor, as philosophers, we have to proceed like crabs, which is not forwards, but sideways. In fact, forwards by means of moving sideways. And that this lateral movement, this moving both back and forward, is therefore the progress of philosophy. And what's key here is that it's not simply an Ouroboros movement. It's not the snake eating its own tail. Because that would imply that there was a static point which could be retroactively imbibed. Instead, it's very much about the fact that there is no solid or neutral grounding upon which knowledge can be based for Hegel, that we're constantly catching up with that which we do not yet know and that which we have come to know about that which we do not know.
Now, again, for Hegel, this isn't simply an aphorism. It's not simply to say that we only know things in hindsight. For Hegel, the metaphysical proposition is essentially that wisdom is not hindsight in terms of having life experience or building upon generational knowledge. Instead, the only wisdom that can be acquired for Hegel is the structural wisdom of the idea of wisdom as such. This is very Hegelian. I covered this in one of the previous lectures. For Hegel, it's not about the content of history. For Hegel, it's about the structure of history. And if you will, this is why certain historicist developments are, or historicist theories are indebted to Hegel. Ironically, many, many historicist theories, many of which are key components of post-structuralism, reject Hegel as being this monstrous idealist of a predetermined grand narrative history. And yet, without Hegel, the historicist assumption wouldn't be possible, which is that we have to count ourselves into history. That the way in which we view history is itself a historical mode, a, a, a historical object worthy of inquiry. This is, for example, I'll give you a classic example is Edward Said's Orientalism. The central argument of Orientalism is the production, the literary production, which mirrors the political production of an Oriental subject that can be dominated or known by the empire. And that this creation of the Orient and the Oriental is therefore something which itself has to be historically investigated, which is to say not the content of the art, of the written works, but instead the structural components by which these works of art said something about the people who were creating them. And the historicist assumption is therefore not unlike that of Hegel. Namely, if the owl of Minerva only takes flight at dusk, then strictly speaking, this means that we have to account for our own subjective errors. And yet where historicism remains distinctly on Hegelian is the idea that this can achieve, be achieved that if we dig deep enough, if we inquire critically enough, we can actually create a form of discourse that takes into account these blind spots. Hence, we end up in what to my mind is the hermeneutic temptation of political correctness. A hermeneutic temptation is a temptation to interpret something. When you interpret the world as how words can be perceived to be given offense, based on historical prejudice or crimes, then the very idea of communication becomes subject to this, if you will, hermeneutics of suspicion, which of course hermeneutics of suspicion is, is, a, is a concept. You can, you can look it up. It's related to the historicist development from Marxism. And that this hermeneutics of suspicion therefore infects our very ability to speak and to think and to communicate clearly amongst each other, precisely because we want to preserve ourselves from that bugaboo of contemporary social life, harassment. And yet for Hegel, none of this is possible. For Hegel, you can't stand back from misperception and misrecognition. There is no neutral exchange possible. This is another one of those Hegelian quotes taken out of context that as soon as you speak, you are doomed. As soon as we open our mouth, we have signified, we have miscommunicated that which we wanted to say, and we are prone to be misinterpreted by others. And yet what's key here is that for Hegel, this miscommunication does not belie the possibility of authentic communication in which there is no misperception. Instead, misperception is the truth of all communication. Communication would cease to exist without miscommunication. Therefore, for Hegel, miscommunication and communication are one and the same thing. As soon as we would be able to correspond perfectly with each other, communicate perfectly in a kind of ideal universal system of grammar and linguistics, this very system would fall apart. And so therefore, for Hegel, this misperception is in fact fruitful. It's in fact necessary. And that the ultimate misperception, the ultimate fruitful error or useless precaution is precisely the idea of an essence that lies outside the corruption of subjectivity. And so we're back at Hegel's metaphysical system, which is to say that
The Kantian empirical problem, which is how can we know reason purely without corrupting or tarnishing it from within through subjectivity and subjective reason, which is to say the conceptualization of essence itself, is itself is a kind of moot problem. It's a pseudo problem. For Hegel, Kant wasn't Kantian enough. He didn't assume the properly radical conclusion of his own work, which is to say that essence wouldn't even exist without this misperception. Think about it, Kant is so interested in the obstacle, the obstacle that he lays in the path between subjectivity and pure reason, namely conceptual reason itself, that he doesn't see that what appears to be a closed door is in fact the opening itself. That reason, that which lies outside essence, is precisely how essence realizes itself. And that therefore there is no essence outside of the misperception of reason. Hence, when you look at Hegel this way, you realize that the classic consideration of Hegel as the madman, the solipsistic monster of idealism, who believes that humanity has to achieve self-consciousness and therefore transcend the material world into some kind of ideal sphere of pure reflection, is completely l ludicrous. Hegel doesn't believe in that metaphysical binary. He doesn't attribute any kind of value to it. And so self-consciousness is not the self-consciousness or the knowing of the content of essence. It's precisely understanding the structure that of the necessary impossibility of the relating between substance and subject, which Hegel, of course, deems self-relating negativity. And that is the Hegelian dialectic. It is self-relating negativity. Hence, the owl of Minerva takes flight only at dusk does not mean that it lands on some other tree and can reflect on the place from whence it has flown. But precisely that this takeoff, this tardy nature of knowledge is itself the truth. That there is no knowledge that arrives at the right time in its particular present. It is a constant series of misrecognitions, misassumptions, miscommunications, failed attempts by which everything has to be repeated in order to achieve its proper substance. Now you can actually understand Marx's famous quip, not even a quip, quite a serious quotation, that history repeats. First as tragedy, then as farce. Now many people use this to make a cynical assumption about the state of the world. Like, for example, re refer to what's happening right now in the Middle East. First as tragedy, then as farce. But Marx's point isn't that something goes from being bad to funny, or from tragic to tragic comedy. Instead for Marx is that everything has to be done twice, at least twice. History repeats itself not because we don't learn the lessons, but because the very act of learning is the act of realizing what you didn't get right, what you didn't see. And so there is no direct correspondence between the beginning point, the foundation of history, and its purported outcome. This is the historicist argument often made against Marx that he traced a linear trajectory between uh, uh, the beginning of time and the necessary of revolution and utopia. And so the whole point for Marx is that the utopian element lies precisely within the fact that the subject has to find himself not within the content of who he is at that present moment, but precisely realize how his subjectivity is created and overturned through the very structure, the invisible structure. Hence why Marx argues that a worker should not seek better remuneration within capitalism. This may appear to be liberation, but is in fact simply facilitating your participation within the very system of exploitation. Instead, once the worker realizes that there is no neutral or authentic a priori working class identity, save for that which is created by the ideological supplementation necessitated to sell the worker back the very consumer goods that are necessitated to be exchanged within the structure of exploitation to which he is a participant. At that exact point, the system already collapses. It collapses because the worker realizes that what is promised to him as his liberation is in fact the very chain that allows that, that keeps him constrained. Hence the idea that you have nothing to lose but your chains is actually an idea that the system has nothing to lose but your chains. And that therefore your very chains have to be sold back to you as the vehicle of your liberation.
As Nietzsche once observed, the best way to keep a man a slave is to convince him that he is free. And that therefore within capitalism, you exploit yourself. Exploitation is outsourced to you so that the very thing that keeps you chained and living an alienated life is precisely that which appears to you as the mode of your liberation. And for Marx, it's therefore not to realize that there are more of us than there are of them. It's not an insight that the workers can take up arms against the elites. It's that once the worker understands this structural mechanism, it has already lost its power. And you know, what's key here is the idea of collectivity for Marx. There's a great passage on the commodity fetish where Marx essentially suggests that if a student were to learn about the commodity fetish and then go out into society, he might well come back to the class and complain that he had seen through it, but since nobody else had, clearly it wasn't true. The theory didn't work. And so we end up in the exact same logic that we have today when it comes to climate change. Strictly speaking, if you separate your trash and, pre and, and don't fly and don't recycle by yourself, it means nothing. In fact, this very behavior may sustain participation within capitalism because you have the surplus enjoyment of considering yourself an ethical consumer. And so the key point here is that at the exact point that everyone has realized that at the same time, the system has already changed. It's not that you collectively decide to do something about it. It's that once you have achieved the collective consensus that it has to change, you've already changed it. That is the moment, the transition from quantity into quality, which is one of Engels' famous laws of the dialectic. And so again, to go back to Hegel and the owl of Minerva, it's not that the owl departs from one tree to land in another, that once it has departed, it has already arrived if you will. And if you go back to previous week's lecture, the previous week's lecture, you will see what I meant here by referencing the, the parable of the empty jar, which fills up by being emptied out. In the same way that essence fills up through subjective misrecognition. In the same way that for Marx, tragedy, uh, history repeats itself. First as tragedy, then as farce. Not in two steps, but both at the same time. Everybody's tragedy is somebody else's comedy. Tragedy and farce are therefore the movement from something being in itself to being for itself. And that is Hegel's metaphysical realization as well. It's not essence versus illusion. It's essence as the ultimate illusion. And yet precisely therefore retained as essence in its self-related negativity. The dialectical unfolding of reason is therefore not the neutral objective stance by which you know the trajectory of history in a predetermined sense, but precisely how you understand the structural mechanism by which your very misrecognition is already accounted for in the unfolding of said history, and that you can therefore never stand back and neutrally assess the situation. And the key insight here, which of course is already shifting towards Marxism, is that you can therefore not allow yourself to stand back, to let other people do it for you, to wait until the perfect moment has arrived. Instead, by means of doing it already, doing it too early, doing it with others, you are already doing it in its exact, precise, present moment. And this is the funny thing to me, like how we talk about Nelson Mandela, who appeared as a terrorist, who was classified as a terrorist and has now become an icon of liberation and peace. It's not that he went from one to the other. It's that the historical symbolic perspective shifted. And so he remains the same man and his actions are the same. And yet our stance on them has changed. And that is why for Marx, utopia is not what comes after revolution. Utopia is the revolutionary component by which what changes is not the substance, but the socio-symbolic framework through which the substance is retroactively viewed. And once you have changed that, you have already changed the thing. And therefore for Marx, utopia is not this place in which everything is good, which would be a utopia, E-U-T-O-P-I-A. Utopia is a non-place. It is a place that has no sight. It is the structural gap between essence and appearance as such, between a subject's substance, namely his ontic nature, and a subject's purpose, 
his teleology, which for Hegel, therefore, is inasmuch the teleological nature of the ontic itself. In other words, for Marx, the theory of history, which is therefore the theory of revolution, is utopian in the exact same way that for Hegel, the theory is dialectical. Hence, Marx's utopia is the structural truth embedded within the idea of the dialectic itself. And we don't have time for this today, but if we were to go to Engels' laws of the dialectic, we would see that as well. That would be dialectical materialism, the unification of Marx's political economic insights back with that from which they were supposed to be deviated, namely philosophy. And so Hegel, to conclude, Hegel's idea of the owl of Minerva taking flight at dusk does not mean that we only know things retroactively. It means, in a sense, that we cannot presume to know, that we have to step into the gap, the cracks, the socio-symbolic fissures that, around, that are around us all the time, the glitches in the matrix, and that from within these impossibilities, the possible is created. That is Hegel's cunning of history, the list der Vernunft. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been my absolute pleasure to share this lecture with you. As I said, a bit technical, a bit abstract, but hopefully also accessible if you're a beginner. If you'd like to download all the lectures, including all the transcripts and the eBooks that I've produced to accompany these lectures, please consider becoming a patron. Not only will you help me keep these lectures online for free and help me keep making philosophy available open access, but you will also be a part of our online learning community and you'll be able to get a whole bunch of more extra features. So please consider supporting these classes on Patreon by going to www.patreon.com forward slash Julian Philosophy. Thank you guys so much. It has been my absolute pleasure to start my week with you. And I hope that you have a very fruitful, inspiring, philosophical week. Bye, guys. And apologies for those of you on YouTube who had some, uh, weren't able to always connect. Uh, that's why I record these as audio files as well. And you can, of course, find the lectures on Instagram. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you next week. And this is going to be the last London lecture. For next week, we will be in Oxford. See you there.